You know, like most young people growing up, I had my sports idols. Uh, maybe you had your, your movie idols or uh, people who were actors. Uh, today, if you were a sports fan, especially in basketball, your, your hero might be LeBron James. Although after the game the other night, if you were a Miami Heat fan and he pulled up lame in the last few minutes of the, of the, uh, of the game, maybe you know nothing about that and could care less about it. But for those of you that don't know, he came up lame toward the end with cramps. The air conditioning went out in the arena they were playing in down in San Antonio. And if you've ever been familiar with being inside of an arena with probably 35,000, 40,000 people, uh, it gets pretty warm in a hurry without any air conditioning. So anyway, he was, he was struck down with cramps. But, you know, years ago, if you were a basketball fan, you might have enjoyed Michael Jordan or Magic Johnson. Uh, two magic names in that sense of the word in basketball uh, lore. Um, earlier than that, if you're a really old fan, you might have enjoyed Bob Cousy. But that's a name probably many of you here in this audience have never even heard of. Uh, every golfer would like to be a Tiger Woods. Uh, he's not done too well lately, but it used to be a man by the name of Arnold Palmer and then Jack Nicholas. Before that, Byron Nelson, you know, different names that we know in sports. And as I said, maybe you're not a sports fan, you don't keep up with it, you, you had looked at people as, as growing up that were maybe actors, actresses, music, uh, whatever it may have been that was there. Your idol may have been any one of these, but they were the things that dreams were made of. You would dream about, or as kids, at least I did. Uh, maybe every male child anyway has dreamed of being a sports hero at one time or another in their life of being able to make the, the winning basket or hit the, the winning home run or whatever else. But, you know, we as Christians, in the book of Acts, in chapter 18 and verse 24, describes a man that, whose name was Apollos, who is, in one sense of the word, a hero in the scriptures. It describes him in verse 24 of Acts 18 as being mighty in the scriptures. Now, most of us in this room will never be a Michael Jordan, uh, a Byron Nelson, a Tiger Woods, but we can certainly be an Apollos. Uh, we, too, can be mighty in the scriptures. Verse 25 gives us a little more insight into this gentleman because uh, there's not a lot in the Bible about him. The scriptures here in Acts 18 uh, give us most of the information we have about him. There's some other you know, mentions elsewhere, but this is where most of it is. He said he was instructed in verse 25 in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. He, sp he, he spoke and he taught diligently the things of the, of the Lord. Now, in verse uh, 25 here, I think it is, the Greek word that is translated mighty is the word dunatos. Now, it is also in, in Galatians, I mean Romans uh, chapter 9 and verse 22, it is translated as power. And those two are sort of synonymous in one sense of the word. But it also is the Greek word from which we derive our English word dynamite. So you see what it means. It's something that's explosive, that's powerful, that is, is really, you know, uh, uh, good. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, to describe it completely, but you understand where I'm going to. Now, what do you think it is that would stand out most about this man, Apollos? What is it that would distinguish him as a Christian from other Christians that you and I can possibly emulate in our life? What is it that we could look to and learn from him? Well, he says he was mighty in the scriptures. Certainly that's something that all of us should be striving to obtain in, in, in our lives. In verse 25 it says he was instructed in the way of the Lord. And then in verse 26 it says when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, had heard him, they took him unto them and expounded to him the way of God more perfectly. He was not really one who was so much a disciple of Christ. He was more a disciple of John the Baptist growing up or you know early years but yet he was becoming more and more familiar with Christ and so Priscilla and Aquila took him to the side and sort of gave him a little update, you might say, in what was going on. He was able to learn from others. And I think that's an important characteristic for all of us as we, you know, journey through our Christian life. How much can we learn from other people? Or do we know it all? Now, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands, but have you ever known someone in your life that knew it all? Uh, no matter what the, the, the discussion was, what the, the topic was, he had something to say on it, and in some cases maybe it was the last word, according to him anyway. Uh, I've known a couple of people like that in my life. 
Uh, and in many cases, they knew a lot. It's just that sometimes a little humility goes a long way in, in going in that particular path. It goes on to say that there, uh, he was able to learn from others and the fact that he was also he was fervent in the spirit. Now, what does the word fervent mean to you? Sort of someone that's on fire. Someone that's really involved with what they're doing. Someone that's really pushing to do what they need to do. Do you think maybe there's some kind of a connection, some kind of a correlation here between these two things they're talking about when it says that he was mighty in the scriptures and that he was fervent in the spirit? you think that maybe there's some connection between those two? Well, I think we all know and understand that nothing worth achieving comes easy. In anything that we strive to do, whether it be in the, in the area of sports, in music, in acting, or just our daily life, it does not come easy. If we want to succeed, if we want to be successful in the things that we do, you've got to invest time, you've got to invest energy, and even sometimes a little pain. There's a saying in sports that no pain, no gain. You've got to really put it out, sometimes go above and When you get to the point where you're hurting sometimes, you've got to go a little bit further to break through to that, to get past that particular area. And I think it is especially appropriate at this time of the year, as we look to celebrate, as Wayne mentioned, the Feast of Pentecost tomorrow, the day that is commemorating the giving of the Holy Spirit over in Acts chapter 2. And there's a scripture over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 that gives us a little bit more of... of uh, idea of the importance of this in the sense it says if any man has not the spirit of Christ he is none of his now for years we have taught that this is in effect the pure definition of a Christian if he does not have the spirit of Christ he is none of his other scriptures throughout the New Testament exhort us to be filled with the spirit there are many many scriptures that we could turn to to that and we know at baptism many of you that have been baptized you know and you've heard it spoken of before that at baptism, at baptism we're given, it's called an earnest or a deposit or however you want to call it, a down payment of that Holy Spirit. So how do we get from that point? At baptism, we have been given earnest or a deposit of the Holy Spirit. How do we get to the point where we are, as it said of Apollos in Acts 18, mighty in the scriptures and fervent in the spirit? I know over the years, and I'm, I'm sure others have been as well, I've been asked many times, how do I receive more of God's Spirit? The person maybe feels they don't have enough, uh, it's not acting as it should or whatever. How do I know or how can I measure how much of God's Spirit that I have? Well, first let's look at what we do know. What do we do know about this particular aspect of, of Christian's life? I said we know at baptism and that with the laying on of hands, we receive that earnest or that down payment of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, and you'll need to turn there, says the Spirit is given to every man to profit. Now, we also know that God's Spirit is not a different Spirit. It's not one for one person and a different Spirit for another person. Because over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, it says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, bond or free, and we have all been made to drink into that one spirit. So it's not a different spirit. Now, if someone has a different spirit than the Holy Spirit, we don't, that's a completely different message. We'd only go there right now. So at this point in time in our life, if we've gone through baptism, we're all at the same point. We all have that same spirit. So then how do we, as I mentioned about Apollos, continue along that line to the point to where it can be said of each of us that we are mighty in the scriptures and we are fervent in the spirit. Well, I think all of us sort of have a, a good idea of the basic answer, but today what I'd like to do is look at this a little bit closer and answer it maybe more specifically. First, how do we measure the Holy Spirit? Can I take one of you or me and turn us upside down and sort of shake us into a measuring cup? and a quart's going to, well, maybe a pint, or maybe we're a half pint low, or a quart, or a gallon, whatever it is, is, is that what's going to happen? Well, as Paul said, I speak as a fool. Uh, that's not the way you measure the Holy Spirit. Uh, then how do we do it? How do we measure the amount of God's Holy Spirit that we have? 
Well, actually, it's pretty simple, and most of you are probably well ahead of me and way out in front of me on this. this one of the answers is found over in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, one of those scriptures that hopefully you have memorized, at least to the location of it, having to do with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, in reading that scripture, if you're looking in verse 22, it says the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not the fruits, plural, of the Holy Spirit. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, does an apple tree produce an apple? Okay. Peach tree produces a peach, right? So the Christian life is supposed to produce the fruit of the Spirit when we have, as we're Christian, because we have God's Holy Spirit, it is supposed to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Now, Galatians 5 and verse 22, in effect, enumerates the characteristic of that fruit. I don't know how you like your apples. I like mine sort of firm, a little crisp, uh, juicy, and sweet with maybe just a little bit of tartness to it. Uh, maybe you like yours a little bit differently. But in the characteristics of the Holy Spirit, what are we supposed to have? I think the first one comes up real quick. Love. Joy. That's not Joy Kern. That's just regular joy. So I just make fun of joy. They're away from us today. Maybe they're listening in. If you are, joy high. Um, peace. Long-suffering. Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. Meekness. Temperance. I'm coming up short. I don't always have enough long suffering in my life. I don't always have the kind of faith that I need to have. So when we look at these characteristics of the Holy Spirit, it gives us a measuring cup of our own life. You're the only person that can evaluate yourself and look into your own life and say, how many of these characteristics are evident in my life that other people see in me. It goes on to say in verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us then also walk in the Spirit. You've heard the common expression, you know, don't just talk the talk, but walk the walk. That's what we as Christians are supposed to do. And that's what it's saying here. If we're going to live in the Spirit, if we say we have God's Holy Spirit, then let us walk in that Spirit so that these characteristics of the, Holy, of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, is evident in our lives. And I said, you know, I don't want to compare myself to anyone else. And I don't think any of you do either. So this is something where we look at our own life on our knees before God to ask us, you know, how we can do better. It goes on to say in verse 26, Let us not be desirous of vain glory, or provoking one another, envying one another. Don't look at someone else and say, you know, well, I've got more goodness, I've got more faith, or I've got more meekness than who? Put a name in there if you want to. The evidence of these characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit in our life is a direct measure of, of the level of the Holy Spirit that we have. And they're also related to how we can become filled with the Spirit or fervent in the Spirit. As we encapsulate all of these characteristics into our life, and you know something, when I said a while ago, there's no gain without pain, it's hard to do some of these things. We as human beings are very, very, at least I am, maybe you're not, are reactive. Something happens that affects me, and sometimes I don't think as quickly as I could or should, and I react to that. I don't always have my emotions and things under the kind of control that I would like to have them under every case and circumstance. That's because I don't have encapsulated within myself fully as I should the fruit of God's Holy Spirit. How many of you can think of a, some world-class athlete or maybe some kind of a world champion of some kind or another or a person who is really at the top of their game? Uh, how about a Pavarotti or one of the world's richest men, Bill Gates? I was very fond of and, and followed the, the career of Michael Johnson. Many of you may not even know who he was, but he was a world-class 
track athlete, set many, many world records. How do you think these people got to where they were at the top of their game? Did they just were born and all of a sudden the next thing they know they're there? Well, if you've read anything about any of these men I mentioned, Pavarate, uh, Michael Johnson, Bill Gates, they worked. They were not what you would call couch potatoes. They didn't sit around waiting on something to happen. Uh, I've read a little bit about both of these and also a lady by the name of Mary Kay. The name is a very familiar. Uh, this lady is at the top of her game. I'm not sure how old she is now, but I think she's pretty close to 90, isn't she? Yeah, but she's been selling and started a line of, of uh, makeup and things like this that has gone worldwide. And I know, I've know i known several ladies that work for Mary Kay. You know the ones that are really good because they do what? Drive a pink Cadillac. <laughs> Although they've gone to now, I think some of them are actually driving a pink SUV. They've gone to a little bit there, so I guess they're the really tough ones. I'm not sure. But, uh, but, but how do they get there? Now, there's no question these people have a certain amount of natural ability, which is a gift from God. But I studied the workout regimen of Michael Johnson, who, is a, who was a world-class athlete, was an Olympic champion, a world champion. Some of these people work out five to six hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Now, you think about that. Michael Johnson is, is a world-class track athlete. He lifted weights, he ran wind sprints, he ran distances, he, you know, he did it all, building up the endurance so he could win his race and be the world's best at it. Now, Pavarotti, again, you know, you think he just all of a sudden jumped out of bed one day and started singing Italian arias? No, he had, he had a good, great bit of talent, no question about it. But he's also spent years and years and years developing his craft. Every person in this room has muscles. Some are bigger than others. The ladies don't necessarily need to develop in the same way as the men. But what would be the difference between my muscles and Arnold Schwarzenegger? <laughs> well, you say a lot. I know I understand that too. But uh, the difference, he has spent much of his life developing those muscles. And it shows. But he didn't get there just by not doing anything. Just by sitting under a shade tree and wishing that he had muscles. If you read a little bit more of the story of Apollos, he was instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke and taught diligently the things of the Lord. He spoke boldly in the synagogue. Aquila and Priscilla expounded to him the way of God more perfectly. And he mightily convinced the Jews publicly. In effect, he had a workout regimen. He wasn't sitting around under his fig tree, you know, waiting for something to happen. He was in the synagogue. He was talking to other people. When he found someone that he could learn from, he learned from them. He was instructed by them as well. He worked at becoming mighty in the scriptures and fervent in the spirit. You know, I don't know, he was Jewish, and I don't doubt for a minute that his parents subscribed to the Shema. You find over in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and beginning of verse 6. If you remember, it says, And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children. Apollos, it says in the scripture, was well instructed in the Old Testament, which is, of course, all he had at that particular time. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way. When you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them upon the post of your house and on your gates. In other words, how often were these people being introduced to the Scriptures in the way of the Lord? Always. From the time they woke up in the morning to the time they went to bed at night. It was something that was a part of their daily regimen. Something that was a part of just growing up of who they were. Apollos was a student. He was a disciple. He was a learner. He wasn't so impressed with himself that he didn't think he could learn from others. So if you and I want to be in the sense of expecting to have more of God's Holy Spirit, we have to spend more time in the Scriptures and become like Apollos was, mighty in the Scriptures. Again, this is a rhetorical question. Please don't answer it. 
How many of you in this room consider yourself mighty in the scriptures? That that could be described of you. It takes more time in study, in prayer, in meditation, in spending time around others. Remember, what's the scripture over in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17? 27 to 17, Proverbs, what does it say? About iron sharpening iron. So a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Spend time with people who will help you grow. And don't spend time with people who are going to pull you down. That's especially appropriate for our young people who are not here, but for those of you on the, on the internet. Uh, many, many years, Mr. Gross and I have worked at summer camp. And we have seen the effect of people who have the right kinds of friends that they run around with versus those that don't. My mother used to say, this is one of her favorite sayings, you run with the hounds, you're going to get fleas. Whereas if you run the people you shouldn't be running with, you're going to pick up all their bad habits too, all the bad things that come with them. The same is true of us as adults. You know, who do we associate with? Who do we hang around? Who do we emulate? Who do we learn from? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Come to church. Now, you know, if you can't, you're on the internet, that's something. That's a way to do it. But be involved as much as you possibly can with those of like mind, those who can sharpen your countenance. Over the years, I used to play bridge quite a bit many, many years ago. Uh, one of the vices I learned when I was at Mississippi State University, um, the house lady up there, any of you, all of you know what a house lady is? Okay, there was a lady who lived in the fraternity house who took care of all of us ruffians, okay? She was a very nice lady. Um, we called her uh, Mrs. Mrs. Hen or Mother Hen. Her name was Mrs. Henshaw, but we called her Mother Hen. Uh, I still have scars in my elbow from putting my elbows on the table. because she would take the fork and stick it with it and say, boy, get your, your elbows off that table. So, you know, she, she taught us a lot. She taught me how to play bridge. Um, where was I going with this story? <laughs> I learned some good habits in playing bridge, especially from people who were better than me. If I always sought out the ones who were not as good as me so I could win, I didn't learn anything. I didn't grow. So it, 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 it's the same with the other things that we do. If we want to grow, if we want to be better, then we have to be challenged. There's another old saying that says, just do it. What that means is, and it's sort of similar to the, you know, don't walk, just talk the talk, but walk the walk. Don't sit around talking about how much you want to learn, how good you want to be, or, or these kinds of things. Just do it. Just go out and do it. Then you can talk about it once you've done it. And I think that pretty well sums up the way that God will increase the measure of His Holy Spirit to each of us. We saw the characteristics of the fruit of the Holy Spirit back in Galatians chapter 5. So, do you ever read those scriptures? Do you ever actually think about them in the sense of practicing them? Maybe one day we read it and we say, you know, today I'm going to do the best I can do to be meek or humble. It's a thought. Or maybe gentleness. Some of us have more need for certain of these characteristics than others. But do we spend time practicing these characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. The more God will give us of His Holy Spirit, the more we practice. It's really pretty simple. Just do it. In Ephesians chapter 4, there's a scripture there that some have asked me about before. In verse 30, it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit. So how do we grieve the Holy Spirit? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19, it says, quench not the spirit sort of goes along with grieve not the spirit so how do we not or how do we quench the spirit for certainly if we grieve the holy spirit and we quench the holy spirit we're not going to have as much of it as we maybe would like to have let's go back to ephesians chapter 4 beginning verse 1 
It says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Now this is the Apostle Paul talking to the church at Ephesus. Paul says, I therefore the prisoner. Have you ever thought of yourself as being a prisoner? Now we've got a Marine, young Marine down in Mexico right now as a prisoner. He doesn't have any privileges. He can't go anywhere. He can't do anything. But we as Christians, while we're prisoners, we have a certain amount of freedom as well. But do you ever consider yourself as being a prisoner of the Lord? That we are so wrapped up in what we're doing that we have boundaries set around us on what we should do, how we should do things, where we should go, what we shouldn't do, where we shouldn't go. Have you ever gone into a place and immediately known, I don't need to be here? There was a, a young man years ago. It used to be that the, the senior class at Ambassador College would take a field trip somewhere. And I think Mr. Gross's class was the last one, that, the first one that didn't get to go. They were that bad. Uh, we were freshmen together, but I graduated a year ahead of time because I had previous college. But there was a gentleman who went down into Mexico. And if you've ever been into Mexico City, it's full of everything just about. I mean, anything in the world can happen down there. You've got the, the markets everywhere where you can go in and buy almost anything. Um, there's almost anything is available. Well, this gentleman <clears throat> was approached by a lady who would like to have an association with him. Uh, and she grabbed hold of him and he literally, similar to what Joseph did, left his coat in leaving her company. Uh, he got out of there. It wasn't the place to be. He knew it. He knew he had made a mistake going where he had gone. So he got out of there. Do we consider ourselves a prisoner of the Lord? I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. You ever thought about being a Christian as a, as a part of a, as a vocation? This is what we do, in effect, not necessarily for a living, we don't get paid for it, but that it's something as a vocation that we go to do every day of our life. That we walk worthy of that vocation. It's difficult to do sometimes. It's very difficult to do sometimes. We do it with lowliness and meekness, long-suffering, and forbearing one another in love. Recognize any of those words from the Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22? We endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There have been times in my life when I had difficulty being in the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That my Emotions got the best of me, and I reacted in a way that I should not have. Skipping down to verse 7, it says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. We have been given so much, so much grace, and we do it according to the measure of the gift of Christ, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Skipping down to verse 12, It's given for the perfecting of the saints, that's you and I, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Unfortunately, that is not a description today of the churches of God that I would like to see. Unfortunately, there's not enough unity of the faith, but you and I are the only ones that can solve that problem of making sure that we are doing that. So we all come in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. I'm not there. I'm a long way from that. And unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. But we hopefully are all striving daily to get there. Verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. And see, these are things that are telling us things not only that we should do, but things that we shouldn't do if we want to have more of God's Holy Spirit. We don't walk in the vanity of our mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. We want to take the blinders off. We want to go into God's scriptures and have Him open our mind to the understanding of those scriptures and then to apply them in our lives who being past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. 
but you have not so learned from Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, or the former conduct, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. I've heard a lot of people use the word B.C. That was their life. Now, I'm not talking about the comic strip. What I'm talking about is before church. You've maybe heard people make that same reference. This is who they were then. Oops, a carp slipped off of <laughs> Turned my ankle. Um, how were you before church? How far away from that person are you today? Is there any relationship to that old person and the new person? The Bible describes it as that new person who has come up out of the waters of baptism. That we left that old person, the old man, buried in the waters of baptism. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, and again, some of the things we shouldn't do. Putting away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be you angry, but sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Have you ever gone to bed just really mad at something or someone or something? How well do you sleep? You toss, at least I do, I toss and turn and, you know, fidget and, and thrash about and everything else. That's, reason, that's one of the reasons it says, you know, don't, let, don't go to bed. Get it off your chest before you go to bed. Whatever you've got to do to do that. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole, steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needs. Whereas as opposed to stealing, work so that we can then give to other people who have needs as we see those needs arising. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. I will not ask anyone to volunteer some of their uh, vocabulary prior to maybe being a little bit more involved in the church especially some of us who have served in the military uh, that's a place where communication sometimes there uh, but you know you see it especially with yesterday being d-day some of the things that these people went through uh, i don't know if you saw anything on that special last night on on d-day some of these gentlemen who went back over to the beaches of utah and omaha it landed there the parish the uh, troopers that parachuted in some of the gliders that you know that came in there uh, the things that they went through we left 25,000 men on those shores and then in, in, in ensuing going in there um, they call that group of people the greatest generation and I know I sort of got off the subject here a little bit but can't help but take a moment to recognize all of those who did you know, and do fight those battles for us. Um, sometimes you can understand when you see what they've been through, why occasionally a little corrupt communication proceeds out of their mouth. But we're supposed to do that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Do the words that you and I speak, do they minister grace unto those that hear those words? And grieve not, in verse 30, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be you kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Is there any person in your life that you today still have something against that you have not forgiven them for. The person that's being hurt the most is you. I can speak that from personal knowledge. So you want to know what grieves the Holy Spirit? You want to know how we quench it? We just went through it. We went through a litany of things to do and not to do. How many times a day times a week or a month or in a year do you suppose that we grieve the Holy Spirit I'm glad somebody's not keeping count and then we wonder sometimes why we don't have more of God's Holy Spirit 
There's some scriptures over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, basically the whole chapter, that would be appropriate, I think, to read. I'm not going to go through it fully. But in verse 19, it says, Quench not the Spirit. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearances of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calls you who will do it. Remember I said a while ago, don't just talk about it. We do it. Christ is going to do, God's going to do what they said they were going to do. Are we going to do what we committed to do? Don't talk about it. Just do it. It's not enough just to be knowledgeable in the Scriptures, but hopefully we, we uh, strive to be like Apollos and to be mighty in the Scriptures, to speech and to teach diligently in the things of the Lord. We strive to speak boldly in the things that we do. There's another principle in building our body as an athlete. It's use it or lose it. Now, for those of us who that have advanced past our youthful athletic abilities, uh, <clears throat> no one in particular I'm thinking of, um, if you don't use it, you lose it. Now, I don't know how many of you have tried to do some of the things, maybe some of you that are over, over 60, tried to do some of the things that you used to could do when you were 20. At one time, I had a track and football scholarship to go to a university held some state records in track. I can barely even run now. <laughs> After two knee operations and everything else, I'm thankful just to be walking. I didn't use it maybe as much as I should have over the way, and I lost a little of it. It's the same way in spiritual matters, even, even more so. If we don't use them, we lose them. Just as Apollos exercised his teaching, we must exercise our knowledge as well. First Peter Chapter 3 and verse 15 says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Are you individually and collectively ready to do that? Do you have an answer to give? Now, as another scripture says, when you're brought before kings and judges, don't worry about what you're going to say, that God will give you that answer. He'll give you what you need to say. But at the same time, we're supposed to be learning. We're supposed to be coming mighty in the scriptures because you know you can't bring something to remembrance if you've never memorized it or learned it in the first place. It goes on to say in that scripture, having a good conscience that whereas they may speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you of your good conversation or your good conduct in Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be having good conduct in Christ. Even if we don't feel like that, you know, we have the ability to speak boldly, we can live boldly. The most effective sermon ever given was the, the life of a Christian who saw what was seen by others, the way they lived their life. We can help others believe and we can help others grow by sharing Jesus Christ with them. I think it was very plain that Apollos had a passion for God's Word. He wanted to share that passion and as such, he was mighty in the scriptures and he was fervent in the spirit. If we too want to be that way, if we want to be like Apollos, I challenge each of us to spend more time with God in the very basic fundamentals of a Christian life, of Bible study, and prayer, and meditation. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, it says, speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all the things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we've been given so much. I look back over the years that I have been involved with the Church of God, and I give thanks every day for those opportunities, those experiences, everything that has come my way. All of my family came as a result of that. And it's just something that, you know, we have a lot to be given thanks for. If you now spend whatever your period of time is, X number of minutes a day with God, in whether it be prayer or Bible study or whatever it would be, 
try to increase it by 15 minutes. Just 15 minutes. Work toward another goal. Set a goal of how long you would like to do it. You can begin it by meditating on a psalm, reading it and meditating on that psalm each day. Develop a regular plan of reading your Bible. There's no way any of us will ever become mighty in the Scriptures without a regular plan of reading, a regimen, a workout regimen, as it were. Have you ever tried to memorize one Scripture each week? Years ago, Mr. Reedy had a whole list of Scriptures that we had in church that we were, you know, gave the list to, to memorize. Nobody was, you know, tested on it. Nobody was, you know, you weren't graded on anything else. But try maybe to get some scriptures like that and memorize one per week. See what a difference it can make even after one week or one month. You might be amazed. In Romans chapter 8, verse 31, it says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us daily. And daily is not in probably your version. I wrote it in myself because that's what it says in other scriptures. He makes intercession for us daily. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? Now, again, this is rhetorical. Who has gone through any of that as a result of being part of the church, a part of obedience to God? Who has gone through those kinds of tribulations or distresses or persecutions or famine or nakedness or peril or sword yet? Now, I'm not saying it's not going to come at some point in time in your life. As it is written, verse 36, For your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, the Apostle Paul, talking to the church at Rome, but also talking to each of us, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature, pretty well covers it all, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So how much of God's Holy Spirit do you want? We can all have all that we really need if we're just willing to pay the price. To spend the time Maybe to suffer even a little pain. Because without any pain, there's no gain. If necessary, to become both mighty in the Scriptures and fervent in the Spirit.